everybody. Thanks for tuning in to Border City's Rock Talker. You get great news, great interviews, great interviewees with sometimes a comedic touch. Make sure you subscribe to the channel and hit that like button. Today I have someone that you might want an autograph from. Steve Lynch. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on, Artis. Anytime. We've been uh, trying to set this up for about... Uh, I think about 12 months and um, I got to give myself credit for the patience because I'm not normally a patient guy, but uh, I understand that you're a busy man and um, you're, you're, you're just, you're being pulled in all different directions. So I appreciate you finally taking the time to, uh, to talk to the viewers. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. Um, speaking of autographs, I'll tell you a funny story. When I was, I was interviewing, you know, Marco Mendoza. I know that name. Yes. Uh, Dead Daisies, Thin Lizzy, Blue, Blue Murder. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, I talked to him yesterday and um, we're talking about when I introduced him as a former bassist of Twisted Sister. And then I started he started laughing because that's Mark Mendoza. And he was saying that, uh, yeah, back in the day, he was signing autographs as uh, Mark Mendoza. And he was telling people, no, it's, it's uh, no, I'm not the Twisted Sister guy. You got the wrong guy. And then he goes, finally, they're like, come on, man, don't screw with us. We've been waiting all night. Come on. He goes, finally. <laughs> oh, so, boy, that's right. So everybody knows you, obviously, uh, from Turn Up the Radio. I got to tell you a, a unique story. I live in Sioux, Ontario, which is on the border of Sioux, Michigan. Okay? Sister okay. cities. And yeah. ladies' night on Tuesday nights at the Savoy was, um, we'd all go there every friggin' Tuesday for uh, decades. And the owner, Sam, I don't know if he's watching, but his favorite song is Turn Up the Radio. And so anytime you walk into that club, You'd hear your triplets, you'd hear your solos, you'd hear the... That's, so that's, that's a great song. Cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Very cool. So, so we were talking before we started recording. We're going to talk about the book you have. Um, it's uh, basically written. You're just getting ready to, to publish uh, in the near future. Um, mm -hmm. But we're talking about your technique and the two-handed tapping. So just give right. us a brief... Um, overview of um how that came about and obviously that puts you on the map definitely for your uh that one song especially well it was basically um around 2000 or i mean 1973 74 when i saw um harvey mandel you know from john mail and the bruce bruce breakers but he did a solo career as, as well which uh really did well um uh, but I saw him playing around with that technique. And so I started goofing around with it. And then there was a guy in Seattle named Steve Buffington that was doing it. And so I, I asked him about it. And he showed me a couple of things. So I, I had been toying around with it for, for a few years, you know, before I ever got to the Guitar Institute. <clears throat> excuse me. And so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, when I went to the Guitar Institute back in March of 1978, shortly after... I started attending, there was a guy, Emmett Chapman, the inventor of the Chapman stick, okay, where you play with your left hand, you play on the lower, like the bass strings, and you play, you comp, like on a piano, okay? Mm -hmm. And then on the higher, there's another five strings that are thinner, which are more the trouble clap. And so right. he would he would be playing with his right hand on, on, on those strings. And so what you had was you had the left hand comping and playing different chord configurations. And, and then you had the right hand playing different triads and solos and melody lines and stuff like that. And so uh, I was just amazed by what he was doing on this instrument. At the end of the clinic, you know, I asked him, you know, because he mentioned during the clinic that he started out on a guitar and he went so far with it that he decided to, you know, uh, invent an instrument so that he could accompany himself like on a piano. And so he said, sure, I'll show you a couple of things that I did on guitar, you know, before I invented this instrument. So I handed him my guitar and he said, you have one pentatonic position right here. And then you have another one in the same key and you can just tie the, tie the two together. He just went. Bruh, 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 bruh. And I just went, oh, God, that's the ticket right there. I've been messing right. around with it a little bit, but nothing to that extent. So it was, it was you know, during the beginning of the, the year, um, going to the Guitar Institute. So I started writing down all the ideas on graph format, you know, like the guitar, an actual guitar neck. So I could see the shapes with each different hands. So I was doing all the pentatonic shapes, all the major scale shapes and uh, uh, chord inversions, triads, um, arpeggios, everything that I was learning at the school, I was writing down two-handed. And so um, 
I just kept doing it and doing it. And by the end of the year, when I graduated, uh, I graduated in March 1979. I had a stack of papers like this that I'd written everything down two handed on. And uh, then when I performed at the end of the year um, for the graduation ceremony, they they asked, you know, I, I was approached by Howard Roberts, who had written most of the curriculum for the school. He's what started it. And right. um, and uh, Tommy Tedesco, who's the this huge, uh, he was like number one studio guy during the 50s and the 60s for all the yeah. television movie stuff that you were doing. So he's like famous, you know, super famous, you know, really, really cool guy. They asked me if I would be interested in writing a book about it. And I kind of laughed and I said, I have enough for three or four books right now. And so they took me to their publisher the next day. And I just took all the material that I'd already written out. And um, uh, I showed them to the, to the publisher, Dale Sedetic was his name. And they were also with Dale Sedetic. And so um, I just showed it to him. You know, I gave him a few examples and showed him how to read it. You know, and so I just played the example that he was reading and he said, you have 10 minutes, I had a publishing deal. And so wow. I put together the book and put it out. And that was it. And that was uh, in late 1979. And so when people ask, you know, if I was influenced by Eddie Van Halen, no, I hadn't heard about him until the end of the, the uh, you know, right before I graduated. And, and um, it was like 19, late 1978 or 79. I can't remember when their first album came out, but, but yeah. I heard it on the radio and I went, oh, that guy's doing it too, you know. But um, I was doing it in a completely different way. I was using, incorporating more uh, the arpeggios and triads and, and interval skips, stuff like that. And uh, he was basically doing the triplet things. At da -da 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 -da. Yeah, he was kind of doing um, this, 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 how I'm a lay person in this way, but um, he was doing um, the triplets on strings where you're kind of doing shapes on groups of yeah. strings. Right, I'm combining different shapes together and I'm jumping across different strings and using all four fingers. So it was a whole different thing. I was incorporating a bit more of what uh, I envisioned that, uh, that Emma Chapman was doing. And so I wanted to bring it into a, a different realm other than a rock thing. And as a matter of fact, I was playing with a fusion band back then, didn't even have vocals, you know? So, so yeah. that's kind of where I veered off into that, a jazz fusion thing. And then I realized, well, there's no clubs to even play out here when you're playing that stuff. And so I kind of converted back into rock and roll. That's what I grew up on was rock and roll in the Seattle era. You so know? And Emmett Chapman, um, would, would it be um, accurate to say there's some, we can find some stuff of uh, his work on YouTube? Oh, God, yeah. It's okay, so e I'll put M E T T and then Chapman. Yeah. Okay, uh, I'll put some links. Yeah. I'll put some links below. Yeah. Pardon me? I'll put some links below after oh, when yeah, I upload this video. Yeah. It's really can. amazing what he does. And there's other there's several other people that have done it as well. You know, so once you once you find that, there's different links to all these different uh stick players out there. And it's instant instrument on its own. I mean, it's completely different. You have to play through two separate amplifiers, one for the bass strings and then one oh. that you have the settings on for the treble strings. You see? Wow. So, yeah, wow. it's a bias thing. So awesome. So um you you left to autograph um how many years ago has it been? We split up um in December of uh 1989. It was the end of the, okay. was the end of December 1989. Well, I didn't realize it was that long ago. Okay, so um, obviously you're taking care of yourself. What do you? What have you been doing? Have you been um, playing any kind of um, you know circuits in the area just to keep busy, or other than writing? You no, know, I, I haven't been as of as of recently. Um, I've I've been writing, and I've been writing for for a number of years now. But it's stuff that's completely different from. From autograph and i did put on a solo album called network 23 i recorded that right. in 1995 and, and yeah. 96 and that was finally released in 2004 which i'm going to remaster and re-release that um okay. but i've also got other things that i want to do um as as far as releasing new material you know that's mm -hmm. See, I, I always look at it like i'm i'm the type of person that likes to explore into different realms and everything i've already got Basically, the, the outline for another book that I'm writing wow. is kind of a mix between uh, Indiana Jones or, uh, yeah, Indiana Jones and uh, the Da Vinci Code. It's like one of those kind of things where it goes way off into wow. this whole different realm. And I wrote, I've got the whole uh, outline for it all written already. So it's just are a we talking actually, are we talking fiction, nonfiction, or are we talking music? 
theory and stuff. There, oh, this on this book, it'll be um, it'll be a fiction, nonfiction. There's going to wow. be some real okay. things. In there. Yeah, just like oh. um, say, for instance, for the the you know pyramids at the Giza Plateau, all the way to Pumacacu, and oh wow, well, and, you must be a fan of Graham Hancock. I got all his books right Me there. Me too. <laughs> Message of the Sphinx and all that stuff. Yeah, he's great. Yeah, I've so. been into. I've been to this, believe it or not, I was given the first a book that um, Eric Von Donegan put out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, uh, called Chariots of the Gods back in 1968. Right. And I was I was only 13 back in 1968. So um, so I read that, but it, I needed a dictionary to understand what was going on. Yeah. So, you know, I, then I read it, you know, uh, several years later where I could understand it more. But uh, by that time, I was already into Zachariah Sitchin, who wrote The Twelfth Planet and all that, and, and discussed, you know, about the, uh, you know, the early civilization. Yes. Yeah. The Samaria. And, uh, you know, about Samaria and Mesopotamia and, and uh, you know, Babylon and, uh, and um, oh, God, the ancient uh, Egyptian technologies and all that. And so yeah, yeah. I into that and read it and deciphering the cuneiforms that were found you know at all these different sites you know and, and actually you know hundreds of thousands of them and uh, they were deciphering them and they understood where all the information came from for early religion so nephilim and Very so let, let me guess did we talk about this because i got a good feeling that you were an art bell fan yes absolutely Okay, because now it's um, George just, Nuri, and he's great too. It's George is good too. Actually, Richard Serrett, if you ever heard of him, he's uh, he's from Toronto, but he fills in for George once in a while. But I think we talked on the phone yeah. uh, years ago. We talked about Art Bell because we talked about this kind of. I've got a stack of books like you wouldn't believe all those books that you mentioned. Yeah. I'm definitely into. Yeah, oh, yeah, we're absolutely. Well, we're, we're well read people, Steve. Yeah, I know, no <laughs> doubt. So, so yeah, I've been into this for such a long time, and it's it is weird. I grew up in Seattle, but it's, it's a very intellectual city, and right. so people at a very young age they were giving me stuff, and I and I was hanging out with this uh, this college professor at the University of Washington, and uh, and his wife and me and my friend would go over there. It was it was my friend's sister that he was married to, and he would turn me on to all these books, and we get into these deep conversations, you know, till. Till five, six in the morning, he would just go off on this whole thing. And I was very young. I was only 13, 14, but I was just absorbing it. And I just, it really triggered that, uh, you know, curiosity in me. So I kept on pursuing these topics, you know, so I'm still doing it today. Well, I mean, I, I, um, I've got a YouTube channel where I just upload Art Bell old Dreamland shows. And oh, cool. a lot of the stuff he talked about 30 years ago has come to fruition, like nanotech. They're talking yep. about stuff 30 years ago, and it's actually today. And back then, people would say, well, people like me and you listening to this, well, that's all crazy. That'll never happen, and it's all happening around right. us. Yeah. Well, that's that's what happens. These guys were talking about something that was, to everybody else, that was so futuristic. But I'm going, well, wait a minute. These these guys are very intelligent people, and they do their research on this. And there's, yeah. there's actually those old... You know, you know the uh, like I was mentioning earlier, the Sumerian and the Mesopotamian or Babylonian uh, cuneiform tablets that they've been deciphering for decades now, and yeah. um, that it tells the whole story right in there. Now, how would they get that information? How would they even know about gravity back then? I mean, we're talking about yeah. ten thousand years BC, okay, eight to ten thousand years BC, and how would they know about um, about you know uh, spacecraft flying and having to use water to blow um you know the to go through the um asteroid belt to get the yeah. asteroids away from them so that they could make it through there i mean it's all in detail I'm going how would they know about anything like that how would they even know about the asteroid belt this was way before telescopes well, you know, and, I mean, and, and, so. and the other thing too some of those stones at uh, pyramids of giza uh, weigh 200 tons how did they get them yeah. when that kind of um rock comes only from 200 miles away and yeah, you know, say right. well, they pulled them on logs. No, they didn't pull them on logs. Yeah. So, yeah. No, there's, just... there's, there's, you know, I listen to Graham Hancock. I listen to people that really research this, and that are scientists also, and they tell, they tell the possibilities of this, and they, they, they tell the impossibilities of it as well. 
and they explain it in detail. And those are the people that I listen to. I don't listen to people that just speculate because all that is is speculation. I want mm-hmm. I want hardcore proof. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that's what I look for. And, right. Uh, awesome, it's yeah. It, it it is fascinating. Um, yeah. Yeah, well, we went on topic, but I mean, the viewers are going to love this because <laughs> I'll bet you, it does. And I love that topic. I could talk for hours on it, but we want oh, to talk God, about me too. Me too. Yeah. We want to talk about your book. Now, um, tell us about the book and okay. uh, when do you think it may be released and basically um, what is it written about? Well, it, it's probably going to be released in about three months. We're down to the very last things on it. But um, as I was telling you in our, in our conversation previously, uh, what happened with COVID was mm-hmm. it, it really set them back a couple of years, the publishing company. And so they had to catch up with the authors that were already signed and waiting for books to come out. And so right. that's why it's taken mine so long because they had to take care of these other authors first. But right. it's down to that last thing where I've already got the the pictures chosen, the order in which they go in, uh, the captions underneath each picture. We've, I've already done all the editing on it and the, the, uh, the accolades and acknowledgements and everything. You see, when you're doing a hybrid publishing deal, which is what I did, what happens is that you have to do all the work yourself. You know, it's it was all me. When you read that book, that's all me. I did all the editing and everything. They gave me suggestions along the way on mm-hmm. how I could shorten it up a little bit in areas because I get a little bit wordy, obviously. Yeah. Well, that's okay. So, uh, so um, anyway, so I did that. And I went through it and I shortened some things. And but uh, when you read it, that's that's all me. I put the whole thing together nobody put words into my mouth and that was it and that that goes as far as the design of the cover and everything i have to do it all um but the good thing about it is that um what's the you, title you of it first of all, all what's that <laughs> what's the title of it first of all oh confessions of a rock guitarist okay it's so not a biography and, yeah it's okay. not a biography right and okay. the, the, what compelled me to write it was that you know, I, I'd be sitting around telling stories to all these people of all these different weird, bizarre events that happened in, throughout my whole life. And um, people kept saying, God, you got to write a book about that. You got to write a book. And then about probably six, seven years ago, I started writing down like single sentence lines that would remind me kind of chronologically of all these different events that happened in my life. And I remember the stories, but there were so many stories. I thought these, I've got to put these into a book. And so I had over 200 different stories. Okay. Just written on those single sentence things. Yeah. It would yeah. Remind there, me of there's, a, there's a word for that, Steve. I'm trying to think of that word where you just write a couple notes and it's basically a paragraph in your head, but it'll come to me. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's actually a chapter in my head, you know, so so it's like yeah. a whole long story. But I had to, <clears throat> excuse me, narrow it down. And so that's what I did is I took out a lot of the stories um, because it would have turned into, you know, a six or 700 page book if I kept them all in there. And so I, I picked out the ones that were, I thought were the most important and really explained what I went through in life and how I got to where I'm at. And so I put those in chronological order uh, when COVID hit, that's when I really, I thought there's nothing I can do. I can just sit at home, collect royalties and write my book. And that's what nice. I did. And so, uh, so that's what happened was, um, I just started putting it all into, like I said, the chromatic format. And then, um, I started in the very beginning. There's a lot of humor in there because, I always look at everything with the humorous side as well. And so it's like, yeah. I kind of have, I kind of have this condition called comic Tourette where, you know, <laughs> funny, funny stuff just comes out of my mouth without me even, you know, thinking about it. That's yeah. why I can't go to funerals. Cause I, I'll think of something <laughs> funny at the funeral and I'll start laughing and then I'll get everybody laughing. Then they'll get pissed off at me because I made them laugh. You know, well, so. you know what? There's a true saying about people when they're uncomfortable, they laugh. So if you laughed at a funeral, just chalk it up to, I'm just really uncomfortable. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but you know there were different instances where I talked, you know, out of place, you know, but everybody started mm-hmm. laughing because it kind of uh, releases the tension in the room, sort of put, yeah. you know. Yeah, and yeah, uh, for sure. You know, 
Yeah, it just became a habit of mine, so I do it quite a bit. Uh, but anyway, um, I learned a lot about myself writing this book and writing all the things out. And I went, my God, you know, I've really never thought this in depth about how my whole life has gone and all the different things that I've been through and, and how it's kind of shaped me into what I am today. And I thought, I'm so glad that I went through all those things, you know, that I, even the, 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 the more horrific things in my life, you have to go through those in order to learn, you know, how would you know yeah. what the good things are if you don't go through the bad things, you know? And so I chalk, chalk it all up to those different experiences and traveling around the world and, and uh, my teaching and touring and everything. So. So where can people get um, a copy of this book when it is released? Oh, it'll, it'll, be everywhere. it'll be Amazon.com. You know, it'll, it'll be on uh, Barnes and Noble.com. It'll be in, in different bookstores. It'll be it'll be available. Do, do you have a private website? Uh, I, I thought you did at one point, but. Yeah, I'm going to restart that up because I've got um, a lot of things to add on to it. It's called Lynch, lynchlicks.com. And right, I've right, got to right. restart that. There's, there's so many things that I've got to add on, like the three autograph albums that aren't streaming right now. You see what mm -hmm. happened? It, I'm waiting for Sony to release that. See, Sony bought out, you know, RCA for the masters, you know, of those three albums. And okay. but then it ran, their time ran out in August of 2022. From, oh. legal, from Sony legally having it. So they're supposed to give it back to me. And there's also two other, 200 other bands that are supposed to, that are supposed to get their, their work released from Sony. And oh. then I can, I can put it on and I can stream it. You know what I mean? And I will, I'll put the whole catalog on there. Uh, but um, so we're just waiting for that to happen. They're working out all the legal details right now. But okay. what I'm saying is that, you know, once, you know, that's released. That's one of the things. And they're going to remaster my Network 23 album, put that on there. And I've I've already, um, you know, got the uh, the whole blueprint for my first three books, The Right Touch, books one, two, and three about the two-handed technique. And okay. so, um, and then I'm going to re-release uh, my instructional video on there. And right. uh, then I have this thing, you know, it's Lich Licks, where it's it's got a hundred different guitar licks and... 50 are picking licks, and then another 50 are just all hammer on, double, double hand and stuff. And I still call it hammer on. I don't know it's everybody calls it tapping, but back then, that's the same thing. It. Yeah. Because, yeah, guess. there wasn't any other word for it back then. There was no tapping and there was no tablature. So, uh, anyway, so you're, and saying, then, you're um, saying the website's still up and running. You're just going to have to um, kind of um, yeah, flush it's, it it's with the older stuff. Running. It's okay. up and running, but I got to revamp the whole thing to to okay. set it up so that people can purchase things directly. Yeah. And I'm going to yeah. have it so that um, they can they can purchase my book um, and I can sign it for them. You know, do a personal uh, autograph on it. So you there know. you go. That's a good cliche with the words. So um, yeah. I'll put a link to um, to that as well, uh, Steve, yeah, below. Um, now I was going to ask you a question when we were talking about you graduated from the Guitar Institute. Any other names that you think, like the viewers that watch this show, are in it for, like you know, Leopard, Dawkins, Van Halen, um, Autograph, Europe, that kind of '80s kind of rock. But I do um, go into other genres. Is there anybody that you graduated with that um, people would know or be surprised? Oh yeah, yeah, Jennifer Back. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She went to the same. We were in the same class. So we became friends when we were going to school there. You know, she was showing me ideas. I showed her ideas. You know, that's the cool thing about the school is that, is that all the teachers there and all the students, the, the students were from all over the world. I mean, there were guys there from, from uh, Argentina and, uh, you know, Brazil. And there was also people from Australia and New Zealand and just in Japan and everything. So it was an international thing, but everybody, uh, you know, there, there was a camaraderie there where everybody showed each other the, you know, different things. And you were learning from the students as much as you were from the teachers because they had a different aspect of the way that they approached the instrument, you know? And so, or they, they had different aspects to teach. And uh, so anyway, um, her and I hung out and while we were going there, very, very busy time. I mean, you were like in school six hours a day. And then of course you had to practice for another five or six or even keep up with the curriculum because it's, yeah. it's a condensed course. It's really heavy. And so, Anyway, then at the end of the year, you know, after 
after she saw what I was doing on stage and, and she knew that I was playing a lot with that two-handed technique anyway, she asked me to, she asked to take some lessons, you know, and I said, yes, of course, you know, so I taught her a few lessons and then she went off and did her own thing with it. And just remarkably, I mean, my, my God, she was amazing. And then she got the Michael Jackson gig and I'm going, wow, cool, Jennifer, that's really <laughs> awesome. I mean, that's, yeah. you don't get much better than that, you know? And, uh, well, you really can't. That was the top. But uh, then she played with Jeff Beck, my all-time guitar hero from the past, you know? And I got more, I, I I stole more stuff from Jeff Beck than any other guitar player. It was basically Hendrix, uh, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, a little bit of David Gilmore. And the last guy that I listened to uh, while I was going to the Guitar, guitar Institute of Technology in 1978 was Alan Holsworth. I listened to him every single day and tried to figure out all this stuff. And I thought he was doing a lot of his stuff two hand, but it was just, he had this incredible reach with his left hand. And I'm just going, my God, I can't do that. So I was, I was doing all this stuff, you know, I was trying to figure out two handed. And so I just loved his style. I, there was uh, two albums that he put out in 78. One was the album UK and okay. that had uh, Bill Bruford, and, uh, Tony Levin and, and, uh, you know, just superstars, you know, and uh, and then he did an album, uh, Enigmatic Ocean with Jean-Luc Ponty. And, okay. I, and so yeah. that's another guy that I was uh, I was learning stuff from was Jean-Luc Ponty, because when I first heard him off, off that album, I started trying to figure out um, all the different things that he was doing on violin. And I did that with Charlie Parker, too. I tried to learn things from saxophone, violin and, and, and different instruments and try to incorporate them on guitar. And it's amazing how it opens you up. And when I was teaching on it, I always tell my students that I said, don't listen to just guitar players and don't try to be like any guitar player because they've already happened. Okay. What you yeah. need to do is you need to carve a niche for yourself. And so um, what, what I do is I, I just tell them to do what I did and that's learn, learn solos, learn the notes and incorporate them any, you know, onto your guitar, any which way you want. And, uh, it it makes you sound different than just any other guitar players. You know, throw in some interval skips. Why not? You can just jump around the fingerboard and do different things. But the main thing is just always write and play from the heart. And that's the main thing. It doesn't matter how fast you play. Nobody cares about that. Everybody's doing that. You know, and it's a cool tool to have to be able to do that. But uh, the one thing that uh, I liked was I liked slow players that really melted their notes out of the strings, like Jeff Beck and, and David Gilmore. In fact, David Gilmore once said, he said, I can sing basically all my solos. And if I can't sing my solos, then I'm playing too much. And that really stuck with me. I thought that's really a cool analogy. A really good way to look at it is that yeah. your solo should be like a melody line. And uh, well, and like, I mean, like say Randy Rhodes, all of his solos, yeah. in my opinion, they all floated the chord progressions in the songs. That's right. And he's one of the first I heard that was doing that as well, you know, because I, I always really paid attention to all the different chords that were going by. And I played triads, you know, double handed triads over those chords to follow. To any, that way it kind of tells a story. You know what I mean? Yeah. You're not just playing notes that are in that key. You're actually following the chords. And that's one thing I really loved when I first heard Randy Rose was, I went, ah, God, he does that too. That's really cool. There's not that many players that actually do that. Yeah, and yeah. I mean, where would he be these days? Like, I mean, that question has been asked a billion times. Two albums, and those two albums of just, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, yeah. he's one of my one of my favorites. You're one of my favorites as well. Um, are you living in the uh, the Cali area now, or are you still in Washington? Pardon me, no. Are you still living in uh, California, or are you in Washington State? Oh no, I I I left California in 1992, and I moved to Fort Lauderdale for five oh. years. So 97, and then I moved up to Seattle until 2016. And and I'm now uh, been here down here since June of 2016. I've been down in uh, Tampa, Florida now. Oh, you're in Tampa? Yeah. Okay, so you're moving around so much. So are you either running from creditors or are you running from ex-wives? <laughs> no, I'm running from bad weather. <laughs> oh okay okay i always yeah. thought you're um um still on the uh the, the west coast but maybe it's just because the last time we talked you were in uh, california so well, i've been i've been back down here eight years now so i lived here five years before so it's a total of 13 years 
But okay. um, that was like, two different times, once on the, the east coast of Fort Lauderdale and once uh, on the west coast where I'm at now in Tampa. But um, in Seattle, I love Seattle, and that's where I grew up, and that's where my old, all my old friends are and everything, and I'm still in contact with them. But the thing is, is I was always getting sick up there. And one yeah. of the reasons is because I owned a music school up there, uh, yeah. Federal Way School of Music, which is still going, by the way. Um, okay. But um, I was getting sick so much because of the students that were coming in. I, I, there was a sign that I put in the front, you know, right as soon as I opened the school, please don't, you know, attend. If you're if you're sick, uh, call right. in and we'll, we'll reschedule. But, you know, kids, they come in anyway, you know, and yeah, no matter how learn sick, and... they're resilient, you know, at that age. And so... Um, I keep getting sick, but it wasn't really that. It was I'm um, allergic to the black mold up there, and oh. so the last year I was there, I was I was sick four times to the point where I had to go to the emergency room. And my pulmonary specialist said, "You've got to leave Seattle." He said, "You may not survive another year." He said, "This place wow. is literally killing you." And so, so a month later, I had gotten rid of everything <laughs> except for a few wow. things that I. I put in the back of a truck and I, I hitched my car to the back of the truck and I just started driving. I didn't know where I was going. I just knew it would be Florida, you know, because yeah, he said he's going to move to Arizona or Florida, but he said the dust might affect you in Arizona, you know, my so lungs. Ex so, explain the, explain this black mold thing. I don't understand that. Explain that. Well, there's a lot of black mold that pretty much grows everywhere in Seattle. It gets into the walls of of houses and everything and so it's it's pre prevalent everywhere most wow. people are not allergic to it but i i'm very allergic to oh, it okay and just the weather up there always being you know overcast damp. and damp and, and rainy and cold right. and so um he said that you just can't live in this kind of this kind of weather it, your body doesn't agree with it and so you know i've lived in florida before and i thought god i felt great when i lived down there before you know almost yeah. 20 years ago and so i came back down and ever since i've been down here i felt great i can oh, exercise wow. i can you know and I'm, i never get sick anything it's just a tremendous difference and it's a, yeah. it's a good one so, that's yeah. awesome well you, you look great steve i won't keep you much Thank longer you. You, you've been gracious um a couple cliche questions what's the opposite of unsubscribe what's the what what's the opposite of unsubscribe uh the opposite of us will subscribe so yeah you want me everybody, to subscribe? well <laughs> well you can yeah i want you to subscribe everybody subscribe to the channel for these great interviews with these great rock stars and since this show is based out of canada it's on the border where most of my uh, viewers uh, are americans anyways um do you have a favorite canadian band or uh, musician guitar player you know there's a couple Remember the pinheads? Headpins or pinheads? Uh, oh, the headpins. Yes, thank you. Pinheads. That's a Saturday Night Live thing. Okay. Uh, yes, the headpins yeah, right. of Vancouver, BC. Yeah. Darby okay. Mills. Uh, another one was Frontline Assembly. Okay. They're very progressive. In fact, they're playing down here in like a week down in Tampa here. Uh, oh, and uh, it's with uh, Ministry. They're playing with Ministry. And I want to go see them. Now, okay. part of Frontline Assembly, the two guys, they started up Delirium, which is okay. another great band. They have these female vocalists and also with Sarah McLaughlin on there and everything. And I, I just absolutely yeah. love them. I've seen them probably five, six different times. And uh, so it's it's those three bands. Now, all three of those, they came out of the uh, Vancouver, BC area. And so, but, um, you know, I love Triumph too and Rush. And so, you know, I mean, Rush is one of those progressive bands. I was just listening to something earlier on the radio. Where I just went, God, Neil Peart's drumming is just so damn good. Sometimes yeah. you just need to hear it out of the blue. And then it just, you listen to it differently than you've ever listened to it before and you pinpoint something that you never you just listen to the overall song but then you you recognize something and it looked you never recognized before and that was how incredible his drumming parts were in there and i just my god that's just amazing you know really yeah. something i kind of i kind of uh use that analogy when i watch the simpsons every time i watch it i see a different good joke so right <laughs> i understand what you're saying with really good music you listen to it more and more and you find, you know, for me, it would be Iron Maiden. You'd find 
just little nuances uh, you didn't say oh and he did that and they right. came in with that uh you know it's just a small trill you know you just don't notice them every time but it's so intricate that every time you listen to it there's something brand new right because i think one of the factors in that is that the, it goes by so quickly you know just like yeah. you, with, what you said with the simpsons i do the same thing with the simpsons i watch it years later the same episode and i go my God, I don't remember that the first time I watched it. You know, it's the same way. I think your ear matures a little bit. You're able to pick out things, you know, better mm -hmm. than you had previously. And um, so you notice more of these intricacies. And uh, it ends up being one of those things where you go, oh, my God, I've never quite heard it like that before. I do the same thing with a lot of the progressive bands, like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. I hear yeah. things where I go, oh, my God. This is really complex, you know, mm -hmm. what Keith Emerson's doing, what Carl, Carl Palmer's doing. Yeah. And uh, and I did, I actually did an album with Greg Lake. And yeah, the whole I thing, that, yeah. that was my first real studio thing. But um, they scrapped the whole album and then they ended up using Gary Moore throughout the whole album. But I was playing yeah. on it. There was, there was Dean Parks and Steve Lukather had played on it and everything. So there was different people in this, in the uh, LA uh, studio scene. That were playing right. on it you know he had heard of me in this technique and so i went in and did a bunch of that but um and he loved my playing he thought it was it was just amazing but the thing is is um for some reason their manager alex grove they just uh they spent so much money on it and then the record company didn't like the direction it was going in or anything and there weren't enough radio friendly you know pieces on it so they kind of yeah. scrapped the whole thing over so that we'll happened. get you alex no yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks so much for your time, uh, Steve. Uh, I'll send you a, a link to this. Oh, I was going to ask it because it's too well. It's not too. So, how's the new band uh, with Georgia uh, Lynch Mob going? See, that's my corny joke. <laughs> I was going to say that earlier. I was going to ask you about the Lynch Mob and just trying to make a joke out of it. And uh, well, I just well, did. Uh, a lot of people you know would always think that we were uh that we were related but oh, um, really yeah because he's actually from washington state too i'm from the I west did, side of washington state i did not know uh, that Seattle, and he's on the east side in spokane washington and oh, um nice. i always i'd always respond by saying uh no we're divorced now and then i'd <laughs> keep a straight face and then they wouldn't know what to think you know and i go god i'm just kidding just kidding you know but um you know just know he was from joke. there but uh, I know there's no relation there. He's, no, like, you know, know, the funny thing is, is that we're like George Lynch was born in October of uh, of uh, 1954. I was born in January of 1955. So just a few months later. And mm -hmm. then Eddie was born like eight or 10 days after me. So we're all right within a few months from one another, you know, so it's, it's very weird. Are you talking about all... Eddie Vedder? No, Eddie Van Halen. Oh, I thought he was born in 58. Okay. Okay. No, no, no. He was born uh, January 26th, I think, 1955. So I was only like, uh, like I think, eight days older than him or something like that. Okay. Yeah. No, but he was born in 55. Uh, we're basically the same age. And, uh, you know, I was just a little bit older. So. A lot of great music came out of that uh, that year, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And when we were touring with Van Halen, um you know, I come to the same age as Eddie and David Lee Roth, and everybody thought that we were much younger because of the fact we didn't come out until really 1984. And yeah, right, so, right. But no, we were all the same age as those guys, so we were we were older than the typical, you know, bands like Motley Crue and Poison and all that, and that were coming out in the 80s. We're like eight, right. ten years old. Those guys, you know. Mm -hmm. So we'd been around the block a few more times than them. We'd already played professionally, done albums and everything. So there's, know, was, there's a lot of um, great musicians that are from Washington. I'm just thinking of one right yeah. now, Jeff Jeff Tate. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Queens right. All those guys originally were from Seattle. Yeah. You know, yep. Chris Carmel and everything. He still lives in Seattle. And Does Hardy, he get a hold yeah. of him for me. I'm gonna try and get a hold of him, but he's probably up in his uh, private airplane flying people around. Yeah, so busy. I... Well, that he he has kind of like a ranch. I think it's up in Woodenville, Washington, which is a great area. It's just always it's it. I used to go there a lot, you know, back before there was any real homes built there, and then they kind of built up oh. the area. Yeah. I guess he kind of owns a ranch up there, and uh, I thought, well, good for him. You know, he just decided yeah. to do the the whole 
you know, kind of the, the home life, you know, rather than touring all the time. And I certainly understand that. Uh, Ricky Phillips, a good friend of mine, uh, just uh, stopped touring with Sticks, you know, because he had done the babies. He had done um, uh, he had done so many, so many tours just and he had been with Sticks for 20 years touring almost, you know, pretty much constantly. And so he just said, no, no more, you know. And for me, I look at it like, yeah, I'll tour again, but I'm going to I'm going to be very selective about it yeah uh, yeah and to yeah. me what's more important to me is is i learned this from the beatles and that's that it's more important to record so that you leave something with people you know what i mean when you're touring yeah. it's a quick fix and people get to see you and that's really cool that's a great yeah. thing and, and, and feeding off that audience energy and them feeding off of your energy and it's and it's a very very cool thing but when the beatles uh after their 1964 tour, 65 tour, they said no more touring. That was it. And they spent all of that time writing the best stuff that they ever did. Yeah. And they just, that's all they did was release music because they, um, they just said the touring just eats up, you know, all your time for when we could be in the studio writing and recording, you know, and thank God they did that because then they spent all that time writing all those brilliant songs that we still yeah. have you know, today. So. And it takes away from family life, and it's and it's not an easy life. It's exhausting. I'm no, sure it's not. Know. Yeah, people don't realize, you know, when you think it's fun at first, and sure, it's fun in your in your twenties and your thirties, but then you know you start getting a little bit older, and it, it gets old. It gets old itself, you know. So yeah. you just want to do something different, and uh, and you want some kind of base, some something you can call home. And there yeah. was, you know, you know, in the first years of autograph, I didn't have an address because I was yeah. just always on tour i mean we were on tour 11 months out of the 12 months of the year you know we'd come back uh -huh. into la and record and, and shoot a couple of videos and then we'd go right back out on the road again you know it was just like boom 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 every uh -huh. year like that so yeah yeah but it was okay. i'm not complaining it was a great experience you know yeah, yeah. But, uh, well the, but, well, know, the I, platinum I, albums behind you says says, says yeah it all, right, right? Yeah. Exactly, um, speaking yeah. of sticks, everybody stay tuned because um, it's, it's interesting you brought that up. I've got Lawrence Gowan tomorrow. So everybody you, check it out. Now? I'm telling the viewers just to stick around uh, tomorrow, Friday. I've got Lawrence Gowan of sticks coming on the oh, show. Very, very cool. Yeah. Yeah. They're right. getting ready to tour with um, Lover Boy and, or is it Foreigner and John Wade? One of the two, anyways. I got to get it I straight. Think Foreigner. That's, that's the other thing is I'm, I'm good friends with. Uh, Chris Frazier and um, uh, he actually played on my solo album. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, Network 23. That was Chris playing on that. And, you know, this was after he played with Va with Steve Vai and everything. So, yeah. And, yeah. but before he, he did anything with, uh, with White Snake or um, Horner. And mm. um, then, um, God, I also had Mike Mangini, who has been with uh, Dream Theater for many years now. And now the yeah. original drummer is back with them. And uh, so, yeah. but both amazing drummers. They both played on my solo album. So very thankful for that. You know. Well, everybody go to the links down below and uh, go to the website, which he's going to be updating. I'm also going to yeah. put some um, Chapman down there so you can check out where uh, Steve got a lot of his inspiration from. And uh, mm -hmm. the book will be coming out in a couple uh, months. And uh, just stick around. Keep checking his website and Amazon for that. And uh, yes, and I'll be advertising it everywhere throughout my social media and everything. So, and I'll so have maybe, links to where maybe, it maybe when that. it's uh, sorry, maybe when it's released, have... come back on the show and we'll talk about it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I would love to do that. Yeah, and I'll hold up a copy of it and explain everything that's in there and uh, so on and so forth. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot yeah. for your time, Steve. Uh, the the viewers are going to be so happy to finally see you uh, again. And um, yeah, thanks a lot for your time. Absolutely. Thank you, Artis. I really appreciate you having me on. All right. Take care, buddy.